Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco, and coming up, we're going to take a look at a million-year-old axe factory, a new custom knife by Dirk Pinkerton, and 12 ethnographic folder designs. But before we get to any of that, I, I would like to, uh, I'd like to get to the comment of the week. I uh, had a very interesting comment this week, kind of made me chuckle, and it might be a little esoteric, uh, but it was on my um, traditional Filipino weapons made gladius the gladius being the roman legionnaire sword and i was getting all flashy with it showing off my kali and kali another another uh, uh term for kali is arnis uh down in the philippines uh it's a it's a different more you know it's a diff it's a little different from kali but it's still stick and knife fighting basically so i was doing my my filipino motions with this roman sword uh, made in the philippines and keelan miles says arnis is not the roman way and uh, I don't know, layers, layers of funny to me because um, I've often wondered when I'm swinging, say, that Roman gladius or something that's not a Filipino blade, but I'm doing Filipino techniques. I often wonder how different can it be? You know, the arm is an arm and it's attached to a shoulder on the same human body. So how different can all of these worlds sword and knife fighting systems be? And the answer is, not much at all, uh, though the Romans had their, uh, you know, they, they had their techniques in their in their thrusting. But, uh, you know, they had the way they fought with their with their sword. Uh, but I prefer to take their traditional Roman sword, uh, part of my personal genetics and uh, and uh, have it made in the Philippines and use my Filipino techniques. Anyway, all I'm saying is thank you, Keelan Miles, for the uh, witty and interesting comment. And thank you one and all for all of your comments. It's always a pleasure to, to peruse them and cruise through them. All right. Now I think it's time for a pocket check. Today in my front right pocket, I featured a knife that I haven't carried in, in a while. And you know what? Frankly, I haven't carried it enough. And that's my, it was my first custom, or no, I, it wasn't. <laughs> one of two custom folders I own at all. And this was the second one I got. This is the Attention to Detail Mercantile Mark I. Uh, and this was, I think, Douglas Esposito's maybe second or third folder ever. And this is not a diss in any way. It really shows. You can tell it is just not as refined. I mean, his knives now are just super luxe and refined. Beautiful, beautiful things. This is a beautiful thing. That's why I bought it. I was totally taken in with that natural micarta inlay. And uh, that was all hand done. Well, that was done with a panograph. Um, so kind of hand done, or at least done with a very, very old machine. And it got that inlay so beautifully precise. Now, if you don't know what a panograph is, I'm going to try and explain it right now. But imagine having a, a, a surface with a scribe that you can draw with. And it translates to a larger mechanical, uh, it has a mechanical connection to a larger arm that cuts things out. I mean, that's my vague notion of how it works. He showed me how it worked. And um, so you can scale things up, scale things down and, and make things kind of exact. And that's that's a very old school tool and a very old way of getting a, a beautiful inlay like this. So the inlay is really what sold it. Um, the, it's a little rough around the edges, literally. There's like, uh, there's, you know, it's, it's a little rough around the edges, but such a beautiful knife and showed uh, the promise that is now attention to detail mercantile uh, folders, man, they're just beautiful, beautiful things. And I hope to be able to afford one again one of these days. Uh, but in the meantime, this one will do. What an amazing thin slicer this is. Uh, that's a hollow ground blade. That's S35VN and a comfortable and interesting uh, look that it's very ergonomic, feels great in hand, reminds me a little bit of a strider, though it doesn't look anything like a strider. It has the vibe and um, 
I don't know, some sort of the spirit of the Strider. Uh, it also, to me, looks like an Italian yacht. So that's another thing that that really drew me to it. Because, you know, if I can't collect Italian yachts, I can collect knives that remind me of them. Okay, next up uh, in my pocket was the a little change of scenery. I went for the uh, Jack Wolf Knives of Vampire Jack. I love this one. And I feel like I didn't give it enough attention. Or maybe what I should say is, uh, the two uh, very bulbous bladed uh, knives that came out, the low drag jack and the canine jack, spear points, uh, really, I was kind of in their thrall for a long time. So when this one came out, I didn't appreciate that more dagger-like slender uh, blade. So I busted it out, and I've been enjoying this one. Uh, and it also has the, this beautiful carbon fiber. You, there are hints of purple in there. And, uh, you know, just... Jack Wolf Knife goodness. This uh, this coffin-shaped handle, this was the October offering, uh, the Vampire Jack, uh, is very comfortable. I, I have to say that these single-bladed Jack Wolf Knives, uh, as uh, you know, these traditional designs made in single-bladed versions designed by Ben Belkin, have really um, got me to appreciate the ergonomics of these traditional designs because most of the knives I have, most of the traditionals I have, have more than one blade in the handle, usually two or three. And though the spines of those blades popping up outside of the handle obscure the, the pure ergonomics of the design of the handle. So if you have a, a rifle stock knife, uh, what is that called? A gun stock knife, and you have a secondary blade folded in there, you're not going to feel the, the ergonomics uh, of the handle. So um, hats off to Ben Belkin and, and all of his work over this past year with these knives. They're incredible. Uh, and so that's what I had on me today uh, in the front left pocket. Uh, in my waistband, I've had this nonstop. This is the Nova One. This is my collaboration knife with Hogtooth Knives. Uh, the uh, pre-order for this is uh, imminent. Uh, Jim and I are working out the details on this. He's helping me out. Uh, and uh, we're going to we're going to release this information shortly. A beautiful sheath. They will be numbered. Um, they will be maroon handled uh, linen micarta with the uh, liners. And we're going to move the jimping up forward so that you can use it when your thumb is up here on the spine of the blade like this. And we're going to take that uh, Knife Junkie logo and reduce it in size. It's pretty large right here, <laughs> but uh, this is good. This is my prototype, and I like the logo all big like that, but that's because it's mine. Uh, beautiful recurve on that, slight recurve, uh, definitely a, li a life extender. Uh, this is not a radical recurve that'll be difficult to sharpen, but it's a recurve that over the years, as you sharpen this 154 cm and use this knife, uh, that very, very, very useful hollow ground blade, when you sharpen and sharpen and sharpen over time, that belly will reduce, but you'll still maintain a good, useful belly because you started with a little bit extra, like many of us do. A nice handle uh, with the um, that sort of Anzo pattern in the center really works well. I love it on the um, on my larger ruffian and uh, and now on this smaller knife. I don't have those grooves on the Tonto, though he frequently puts those in. Uh, I like them because. They're comfortable. They give you a place for your fingers to sink into. But also, when you're changing orientation of the knife, changing the grip, they're great for, you know, that little pinch uh, in the middle of the handle as you kind of twirl it around. So just a great knife. I'm really excited to be offering this. And um, it's it's my blade design and his platform. Uh it's the most comfortable, carryable fixed blade I've ever had. His uh, the Tonto that he made. So, uh, if you don't know the story, I asked him, "Can we do one in uh, a blade of my design and 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 offer them to the audience of the show or whoever wants to buy them?" Very happily said yes. It's called the Nova One. And then, uh, if we have success with this, we'll do another blade shape, and that'll be the Nova Two, and so on and so forth. Okay, in my pocket for emotional support today, which is an uh, important role. Uh, was the baby rhino, the off-grid knives, baby rhino. I just love this little baby. Uh, you know how you know how parents uh, you hear, well, mothers more often, but once the babies are grown, they start miss having babies around because they forget 
<laughs> what it's actually like having babies around. It is lovely. Babies are awesome. Uh, but it is nice when they grow older and a little more independent, let's face it. Uh, but uh, this baby rhino, we got three of them in the house and they don't grow up, which is nice. Uh, and they also don't require education or food, which is also nice. Uh, this is the uh, coyote with gray wash. My wife has the full gray G10 and gray handle and then we also have the all black blackout such a great little useful knife my wife uses hers all the time um seems like boxes come to the house all the time and they rarely say robert demarco on them unfortunately uh so she'll get after them with her little baby rhino that's been her that's been her thing it's kind of uh it's it's finally uh uh taken the jolt the old kershaw jolt out of its uh out of its position of prime knife for her hey and if you're gonna have a prime knife an rj martin designed prime knife is a good one uh but let's face it this baby rhino baby rhino is a charmer and fun to play with and great to use all right that's what i had in my pocket today the a2d mark one the jwk vampire jack the tkj and h uh, hogtooth nova one and the off-grid knives baby rhino what do you have in your pocket let me know drop it in the comments below i always love to find out uh, which you all are carrying. And uh, and let's take it from there. Take the conversation from there. Up next on the Knife Junkie Podcast, we're going to talk about a couple of very interesting stories in the, the Life Knife News. All right, talk to you soon. If you're a knife junkie, you're always in the market for a new knife. And we've got you covered. For the latest weekly knife deals, be sure to visit the knifejunkie.com slash knives. Through our special affiliate relationships, we bring you weekly knife specials on your favorite knives. Help support the show and save money on a new knife. Shop at thenifejunkie.com slash knives. That's thenifejunkie.com slash knives. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Perusing the internet, as I am one to do, uh, I came across an interesting article in Knife Magazine uh, where some archaeologists discovered it, uh, at this at this dig called Melka Kunturi. Now, I'm sorry if I'm butchering that, which I'm sure I am, but in Ethiopia, they found a, a, not an obsidian axe factory, a hundred one point two million year old axe factory where they were making obsidian. Now, factory meaning they found uh, 578 individual unique obsidian tools. And this is a, quote, staggeringly early example of obsidian shaping, uh, you know, which I think is really cool. I mean, when you think about numbers, when you think about time, you know, our government throws around the term trillions like it's nothing trillion is is incomprehensibly large uh but even 1.2 million when you think of the human race and how long we've been around like that's another creature uh that was making that something that we were derived from perhaps i don't know depending on your belief but 1.2 million years ago that's a long time ago uh so it it seems that there was an industry for this in ethiopia um so i i think this is incredibly interesting and by the way uh the ethiopian uh uh, Ethiopia was where the Greek gods would go to vacation. So maybe there's some connection there. All right. Uh, not to totally, uh, totally destroy the intellectual nature of that story. I, I will move on. Um, <clears throat> a new Alabama made folder. This is interesting to me. Bear edge, you know, bear and sons, uh, they're in Alabama and they make all their knives in Alabama. Uh, as, as far as I know, including their switchblades, which I think is very cool. No one really talks much about them, Baron Sons. I'm going to try and get them on the show and talk about it. They're making a bunch of knives in the United States, and this one just came out, and I think it's very interesting. It's a steel frame lock with lots of beautiful milling and knurling on the handle. It's got a very useful and, let's say, fashionable uh, sheep's foot blade. looks kind of like a um, <clears throat> Insingo blade. Hollow ground. Uh, so uh, inexpensive deep carry pocket clip hollow ground that's uh what is it 420 or uh, 440 hc modified sheep's foot i think this is cool it's made in jacksonville alabama um we talk a lot about how there's no manufacturing here there's very little manufacturing here but this is a legit manufacturer they're not they're not a small 
uh, batch house. So I need to find out more about this. Wanted to bring this to your attention. See if it's of interest to you. The Bear Edge folder made in Alabama. All right. <clears throat> Next up, this one's interesting from Fox Knives, a new multi-tool, but this time a knife-based multi-tool. Uh, we've seen Boker do this. We've seen, uh, well, uh, recently Medford has done it with their um, ASK, uh, American Service Knife. I love this. Uh, this is more my speed because I'm not much of a pliers user. It's great to have Leatherman and, and those kind of plier-based uh, multi-tools. It's good to have one around, but I, that's not the kind of thing I carry on my person or need on the daily. And I realize a lot of people do, but I'm more of a knife-based multi-tool user. So this looks this looks exactly like the kind of thing I need, especially in the configuration right here. This uh, it's just announced. Uh, they are not. Uh, this has not been um, released yet, but uh, they're going to be calling it the Volpus. Uh, Maniago made and they're going to have two classes N690 steel or M390 steel the N690 will have an aluminum body and the M390 you'll have your choice of titanium or carbon fiber you can get the wood saw scissors bottle openers screwdrivers but to me it's like if it's if it's going to knock the Victorinox out of its spot it's got to have tweezers it's got to have a toothpick and those scissors have to be on point. So I'm sure they will. We'll see. Fox Knives knows what they're doing. Can't wait to check that one out. All right. Condor Knives has uh, dropped some of their knives, released some of their knives at SHOT Show. I shouldn't say released. I should say announced. Some cool stuff. Uh, interesting. You know, we, uh, we know Condor for their large fixed blade and machete like knives, but uh, recently they've been um, dabbling with folders. So uh, this first one, if you scroll down, the the baby Cadejo, excuse me, an FRN handled um, backlock with 420 HC steel, um, little GRN, 2.13 inch blade. You know, not exactly my thing. Uh, looks kind of like their version of a Delica or something like that. But the interesting thing is that they're flexing and um, and they're reaching and they're trying something else. <coughs> going beyond the high carbon steel and wood handles and going for this FRN lockback sort of uh, setup. Interesting. And let's see the Terrachi. This next one, this is a Joe Flowers design and it's his follow-up to the Terrasaur. The Terrachi, like machete, uh, Terrachi. I don't know. It's hard for me to pronounce, but it's it's got the same sort of plastic handle and it's got a large, beautiful, uh, um, leaf shaped blades 14.6 inches and compound ground so it's a little bit thinner you can see like you can see a little bit of a different edge towards the handle well that's a little bit thinner so you can get up there and do some carving saw a cool video uh, i can't remember if it was knife center or blade hq but in their coverage of shot show they talk with joe flowers and he talks about this one quite a bit cool cool knife uh scrolling down this one looks good to me this is a 5.9 inch uh 420 hc a uh, knife called the Patagon by a survivalist named Walter A. Matthews. I just think it's handsome. I would love to see that swedge being fully sharpened. Uh, I don't know. Looks cool. Also looks a bit like a steak knife, especially with that handle. And then and then the last one I want to touch on from Condor Knife and Tool is the Norse Dragon Cleaver. Um, I have the Norse Dragon Sax. Um, but this thing, this, so this has the same handle. I think it's goofy as all get out i don't know look at it tell me what you think uh i think it's an ugly design for a cleaver i think it's unnecessary and you're like bob what why would you say that and, and i would say because it's ugly uh if it were cool looking i'd say okay i can get with a with a with a norse cleaver but it looks to me too much like it's reaching to be a regular cleaver they should have pushed the sort of sax shape but still made it a big fat uh, bladed cleaver uh, and I would tell them to follow me for more suggestions on their designs so that's what we got coming from Condor some interesting stuff and then um, I mentioned this but it bears mentioning on this show real quickly Spartan Blades and Les George uh, have a new Fairbairn Sykes dagger tribute the Fairbairn Sykes is that dagger right over my shoulder here um, originating in uh, well so so uh, He's making, uh, Les George designed a budget version, okay? So if you know Spartan Blades, you know they're expensive. And he's got a knife with them already, a dagger, 
uh, I think it's the V14, um, that is like a $400 dagger. This one is $150. That's part of why I'm so excited. But look at this thing. It is a it is a beautiful dagger. It's got the perfect proportions, very much in line with the Fairbairn Sykes. Seven inch blade, that's SK5 steel, part of why it's inexpensive. And those are injection molded handles. So I am beyond excited for this $150 dagger from Spartan Blades and Les George. Uh, last up, uh, Tempest, our good friend uh, Casey over at Knives Fast uh, has his his knife company, Tempest Blades, uh, Tempest Knives. I have his uh, his first release. It's over there. I meant to have it here so I could flip it out for you. Uh, but um, he's coming out with a new one called the Micro Burst, and he's continuing with his blade theme of this uh, uh, drop sheep blade. So it's kind of a drop point, kind of a sheep's foot because uh, you got that curved blade, but still uh, predominantly a sheep's foot. This one comes in at a square three inches, 14C28N. You got the wire pocket clip, micarta. I'm sure, uh, like the um, uh, like his previous release, which for some reason is totally escaping me, the name, Pinion. Uh, it will probably have different handle scales, no doubt. And uh, liner lock looks like a really handy little knife. I like the the little choil up front. Uh, I'm not usually too much of a choil guy, but it looks like it'll be very useful for this one for getting a full uh, four finger grip. Uh, Pre-order is up on this one. So uh, go to Tempest Knives and check it out. All right. That about does it for the life uh, knife life news coming up. Uh, we're going to take a look at a new custom knife from Dirk Pinkerton and then 12 ethnographic folder designs. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkie's merchandise at the knifejunkie.com slash shop. You know, I talk about Dirk Pinkerton quite a bit and his ability with a grinder. We all know that he designs great knives for collaborations with companies like Kaiser, Concept, Beyond EDC, etc. But his hand skill with his grinder is outstanding. This is my cave bear that I got from him um, at Blade Show 2021. I uh, love this thing. Well, look at what he just sent me. And uh, well, I showed this off before and I told you I'd be buying it after the new year. But now the deal is done and here it is. And I love this thing. Uh, this is here, I'm going to show it in the sheath first because the sheath is awesome. This is the Razorback. Uh, I added this. He He does not add clips, which is fine by me because it allows you to just get what you want. Uh, I, I chose this instead of a discrete carry so it could be a little bit further from my body. Uh, really excellent retention, but let's get to the knife. Look at this, honey. All right, so I showed this off on the channel when he sent it to me as a loner to check out. This is smart. This is a, something that people have done with me because they get it. They send it, they put it in my hands, and I'm like, okay, what do you want for it? <laughs> and this one, he sent it to me right before Christmas. I couldn't afford it at the time. Uh, I was just, you know, busy buying gifts for other people. So I said, uh, can, can you hold it? He said, yes. He put an edge on the back and here it is. This is LMAX steel as is uh, designated right here. I like when people write, I like when knife makers uh, put things on the spine. Uh, you've got a, um, Antique micarta, it's so beautiful. I just oiled it and kind of darkened it a little. Uh, we'll see what happens if it if it lightens up again. But just a beautiful, beautiful micarta feels so good in hand, and uh, a short-ish handle. And that is something that I really like about this. It it is just enough handle because it allows this to be carried easily. Uh, even though that's a long blade, I haven't measured the blade. One, two, three, four. Five. That's a six inch blade. This is longer than, so I carried this around with me yesterday. Now I did not drive and I didn't do much sitting uh, with it, but it was very comfortable just in my waistband uh, moving around the house. Um, I do, I do think it will be a little bit much for 
you know, all day at work or something like that. Not only that, but I don't need to be carrying a six inch double edge blade at work. Uh, so this LMAX is so thinly ground, hollow ground, um, that I, I don't know. I, I think he's just showing off at this point. He's just being a show off. It's, it's really, really thin. So what I, what I'm going to do, um, I never do this, uh, uh, well, I usually never do this, but when I do the review of this, I'm going to do my very best with the calipers. Uh, it, it feels as thin as a jack wolf knife, maybe even thinner. I don't know. It, you can look at the cutting edge and barely see that it has one because, because it comes to such a fine, fine edge back there. Uh, just a beautiful fighting knife. That's what this is. Now, he sent this to me when I was going when I was in the thick of my Bowie phase which has, you know, it's receded a bit. Uh, but uh, he was like, yeah, you like, uh, you like boys? You like clip points? Check this out. And I was like, man, that is one long clip. To me, it reminds me a bit of a jambaya or some sort of, or of a Middle Eastern blade, you know, the curved double-edged blades. I absolutely love that. There's no reason why your curved blade can't be double-edged. And uh, in, the, in the Middle East, they really, uh, really nailed that. Uh, again, that handle is great and great for reverse grip. Faceted, uh, uh, faceted with chamfers, just, just great. So refined. Uh, and I have to say, um, if you like Dirk Pinkerton's fixed blade designs, go, go and get one. Uh, they are incredible. He does a beautiful, beautiful job. And one of the things I really like about his designs, his fixed blade designs, is that they always have one foot in some traditional ethnographic design. And that's what we're going to be talking about here in a minute. So do check out Dirk Pinkerton. And uh, man, look at this thing. Uh, you know who else has one of these? Dave of this old sword blade reviews. You may have seen him. Uh, his video of this. He had uh, Dirk extend the um, the flat here and the jimping so that he could go with a Filipino grip on this. And if I were to get another one, I would do that too. Uh, but, you know, I, I think one razor back at a time uh, will do me just fine. All right. So now speaking of ethnographic weapon designs, uh, I want to get to these folders. I realize all of my favorite folders have their um, their their legacy in some sort of design from uh, another nation or this nation, but but from a culture, a specific culture to which that knife was important. So we're going to start with the United States and American culture, and we're going to start with one of my favorite knives of all times, the Hinderer XM24 Bowie. Now that Bowie shape is. This is just a perfect and beautiful Bowie shape with that long clip. The double peak is something I really like that uh, I first discovered it on the SOG uh, Bowie, the, the Mac V SOG style Bowie, that peak peak. Uh, but here, Rick Hinderer has taken that to, to an extreme and really uh, pushed that clip way far back. I just love it. I think it looks beautiful. This is one that... I, I have always flirted with the idea of having um, hollow ground by someone. But then I think this is the big one, you know, like maybe if I had this still in the XM18, I'd have that done. But this is the big one. This is the big, big, robust one. So maybe I should leave it that way. A and B, it's expensive and hard to find, or at least it was hard to find. This is a Gen uh, 2 XM24, so it doesn't have the, the triway or anything. And I just don't want it, the chance of sending it out and having it jacked up. Now, the people I would send it to wouldn't jack it up, but still, you know, you get cautious. Uh, so there it is. This is the the Bowie knife from America. And uh, uh, Jim Bowie created it originally. And, of course, we've seen clip points further back in history, but the Americans really owned it with the Bowie knife and the XM24. All right. Next up, uh, this one's near and dear to my heart because it's the uh, my ethnic heritage, Italian. This is the Patata folder from uh, Spyderco. And this is a knife that is um, uh, sort of a symbol of Sardinia, an Italian island. And this is their kind of do-all knife. It's a folder uh, that can be used for all things. It is their, their EDC folder. It can also be used as a weapon, naturally. I think... I, but this is not billed as such. 
traditionally, but I look at that blade. I mean, it is a very, very uh, acute, long, um, I see a thrusting style blade here. Uh, but what else could you see? You know, Italians are known for their craftsmanship, and I see a great uh, craftsman's knife. Uh, it also reminds me a little bit of the Kiridashi, which will be coming up uh, on a little bit later uh, from Japan with that very, very acute tip for for precise precision work. Um, I was in in looking at this, I, I was uh, looking at some traditional patatas online, and I think it, it would behoove me to get one, uh, you know, for cultural enrichment. Um, but they're just beautiful. And I've seen some with uh, various kind of locking styles. Uh, this one, of course, is a liner lock N690 CO contoured um, scales. And this one, I believe, is made by Lion Steel. It's made in Maniago, Italy. Let's see, as it should be. I think it's cool that Spyderco, um, Spyderco has some of their knives manufactured in the United States, in Golden, Colorado. They manufacture them, some some of them in Taiwan. Some of the, those are considered oftentimes the, the like the highest end. Um, uh, they have knives manufactured, some in Italy, some of the special ones, and uh, in China. I think it's cool. Uh, they go to different places for different, uh, different qualities of knife. Okay, next up, also a traditional folding knife from a Latin country that I have to get is the Navaja. And in this case, it's the Night Horse, uh, Dirk Pinkerton design. Dirk Pinkerton, who we're just speaking with, or speaking about, uh, designed this. He he really, here, here it is, another ethnographic uh, uh, inspired design by Dirk Pinkerton. Now you will you will look immediately at the tip and you will say that does not look like the tip that it started with, you're right. I dropped it and broke it, broke off the tip, but I've been working uh, to sort of sharpen it and kind of get it back to where it needs to be. Um, but it's kind of a depressing affair. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if I can actually make it work here. Uh, but this Beyond EDC version is amazing. This knife is really incredible. And it comes in this, yes, $30 version in three different uh, colors of G10, or uh, or you can get the $180 version with it as a titanium frame lock. Now, I've decided after dropping this on its tip, I'm going to buy a couple more of these uh, in the G10 and have a couple of pristine models. I, I just think this is beautiful. And um, this is right up there with the design of the, uh, the Miguel Barbudo Wee Knife Blacao. And it's up there with the design of the Cold Steel um, Espada series. Three three knives here that were inspired by the Navaja, the Spanish folding knife. Uh, oftentimes very large, mostly with a ratcheting lock on the back released by a ring that was developed by the Spaniards once they were not allowed to carry swords to settle their gripes. So they carry these big massive folders that looked a lot like this and uh, stick them in their cummerbunds or their, their waistbands or wherever they kept them. And then they pull them out to defend their honor. Um, this is just a, ah, just a perfect modern representation of that knife. One, two, three, four and a half inches in the, on that blade. Very light, super, super action. Beyond EDC is an awesome company, man. They're making some really sweet knives. And uh, like this one, uh, which is on their lowest tier of production, um, very inexpensive, super high quality. And then, like I said, you can go up and get their uh, asymmetrical line um, a version of it in titanium. All right, next up is the Japanese Tanto. Now, I don't have any folding Japanese-style Tantos uh, like the ok ot Okanashi, Otanashi no Ken or the, or the James Williams designs, which have a more sweeping and not faceted blade design. So here I have this as Japan America, because this is an Americanized Tanto blade as interpreted through the Chinese <laughs> in Riot knives. So just this is the K2. And when I think of Tantos, even though the traditional Tanto has a sweep to the blade and does not have that forward facet, um, I still think of, of the Americanized Tanto. 
made popular, if not originally designed by Lynn Thompson of Cold Steel, um, where you have a hollow ground, long, flat, hollow ground blade that's straight in edge or slightly curved. This one is straight in edge. And then it comes to a secondary point, the Yakote and this flat ground front chisel portion. Very frequently, this front chisel portion is straight which really adds to utility, I think. In this case, it's curved, which adds to tacticality. <laughs> I think it makes it a nice uh, slasher. Also, it's it's a nice, if you need to rock cut, I've used, all right, this is going to get a little uh, specific, but you ever use those brother label makers, you know, and, they, and then you clip it off? Um, well, sometimes you'll make a couple of labels and then you have to clip those. Well, that forward tip is perfect for rocking a cut against the cutting board against uh, through one of those things. So high utility, high weapon ability. And of course, this uh, being a Riot, it's just perfectly built. Uh, this is titanium, bronzed titanium, this sort of dragon scale pattern, just beautiful. Um, I would, you know, as I was writing this and I thought, you know, well, this is an Americanized Tonto. So it, it was, uh, you know, definitely inspired by the Japanese, but it just made me feel like for equal representation, which is important, I need to get a, a true Japanese style Tonto in the in the collection. So I, I need like a James Williams uh, style Tonto, wouldn't you say? OK, after a sip of coffee. From Indonesia, we're going to move to a knife from Indonesia. What do you know? Uh, this is uh, the Indonesian Karambit inspired uh, Fox Knives 599. Uh, this is, to me and my eye, just a beautiful karambit. And um, I used this one for a number of years in my Kali training. Uh, not this one because it comes, it doesn't come with, you can buy an orange handled trainer of this. And it's just, just like this, except a uh, different blade, obviously. But it's weighted the same. It feels the same. And uh, this is a great karambit because it's small and it fits my medium sized hands perfectly. The original of this Fox 479, uh, the first one they made, looked just like this, but it had a longer aluminum handle. And that long handle uh, was due to a um, was due to a an error in translation. You know, something was lost in translation when the design was sent from America to Italy, and they made an extra long handle. And then they eventually uh, created this, which was the original design with a handle a little bit more in keeping with with <laughs> human sized hands. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful design, beautiful knife and karambit and good for doing all that karambity stuff, which I'm out of practice with and I shouldn't do all on camera with a live blade. So I'm not going to. I'm going to stop doing that right now. Uh, but uh, liner lock, not much of a flipper at all. Look, you got this flipper. Watch. Want to see the flipping action? Watch, watch. All right, so that's how it flips. So that's more, so there is a problem with this design, but I'll get to that in a sec. Uh, awesome wave, and that's what you want. For a karambit, folding karambit, you want it to be, you want the clip on this side, you want the blade to be facing forward, and you want a, um, a hooking, uh, some sort of hooking wave type thing. Otherwise, you're dead. If you're going to use this for self-defense, otherwise you're dead because it would take, I've seen some karambits that are oriented this way with the clip here, which is just absurd. Uh, but you would have to pull it out, open it up and then reorient it and put your finger in there and, and you're in heaven at that point, hopefully, and not the alternative. So yeah, you definitely want, uh, if you're going to carry a karambit for self-defense, it has to be tip up it has to be blade forward. It has to have a wave so that you can pull it out and bring it to bear immediately. Otherwise, you're fussing, fooling around, trying to flip it in your hand and get it to the right position. Now, uh, as I mentioned, there's a serious flaw with this design, and that's right here. The flipper, as I mentioned, does not act as a flipper. I mean, I guess you could really get it started and then whip it out. Uh, and then when it's forward, it doesn't really act as a blade guard because... Before flippers were known for their lovely action and fidgetability, that flipper was there to assist in the wrist whip of opening it or the centrifugal opening of it. And then it was there as a 
uh, finger guards. So your finger didn't slide up onto the handle. Well, here it's unnecessary, and it is not here. Let me. It does not mesh with the handle design. You see that little extra thing there. Now that's great if you're trying to kill someone and cause pain because that gouges like you wouldn't believe. But when you have the training version of this and you're doing drills with people, it's still it's still the same. And I've hurt a lot of people with that. And, um, you know, just by accident because it gouges uh, in, in there and it just is not a good design. So that's the one thing if I cared enough and if I were carrying this, I don't really I'm not such a karambit guy. I would get rid of that. I would grind that off altogether. But if you do that, if you have one of these and, and I've put the idea in your mind, just be careful because this flipper tab is inter integral in nestling into the stop pin. So you've got to be really careful with how you contour it if you're to grind it away. So that's from Indonesia and, and the Philippines, the Karambit. All right, next up, also from Indonesia and the Philippines, is the Chris. And... Cold Steel, no one is doing it better in a production knife right now than Cold Steel. I am just so impressed with how they manage to make these blades. And I know they're, it's an automated process and such, but to get the edge so sharp, so perfect uh, with the contour of the blade, that's something. I think that is something. Uh, this I have in uh, this four inch version. I have the large six inch version. This is the tie light from Cold Steel. In, and uh, and I also have their Voyager uh, five and a half inch um, Chris, which is also awesome. Uh, the thing that you will see about the or that you will find out about the Chris is that it is a it is twofold uh, in Indonesia and in Philippines as something symbolic and as a status symbol, but also as a really effective uh, combat knife, combat blade style. Those waves on a thrust just widen like a bread knife. I mean, they just saw into the person and widen the wound channel. And then <clears throat> also on a slash, there's a lot of slashing and, uh, and, and uh, cutting in Filipino martial arts. Those waves kind of do the same thing. It's like, it's like pulling a bread knife over someone. And then at the tip, they always terminate with a hawk bill. So tip slashes and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's like having a hawk bill or a karambit blade down at the very end. So it is not just for impressive looks and to look different and crazy. Uh, the Chris blade is really a, um, uh, you know, very, very, very useful combat blade. We saw it in the flamberge, the big giant, you know, six foot tall, two handed uh, swords from and, and the great swords, great uh, swords from Germany that had the waves in them. Same thing. I mean, same concept. You see it. It's cool how you see things pop up all over the place, different cultures, different times. Like I said, uh, the Americans didn't invent the clip point. Jim Boy didn't invent the clip point, uh, optimized it, popularized it and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, in general, there's not much new under the sun, uh, but some people just do it better than others. And the Indonesians and the Philippines, uh, Filipinos really maximize this wavy blade shape. And Cold Steel, a modern company, is really... Um, maximizing it for the modern market. All right, next up. This is an interesting one. I don't know much about the, the uh, it, this is this is from um, uh, Crystal Knives. I'm sorry, geez, it's right in front of me. I could just read it. Uh, Crystal Knives, this is the Crystal Aurora uh, from Ivan Braganetz, a, a Russian designer. And this is based on the traditional Siberian Yakut knife, a, uh, a hunting and utility it's like it's kind of like the siberian version of the of the hudson bay knife just kind of an all-arounder but it's it's known for having this giant fuller in the blade and um this came to me from uh levon of the knife nuts podcast and from russia with levon and he uh, imports these cool knives many of them designed by I ivan braganetz and made by crystal Crystal knives. I always want to say crystal like it's champagne. Crystal, crystal knives. Um, but this one is really cool. Uh, this one's hard to come by uh, at this point. I'm not sure if he's still, if they're still making and uh, bringing these in. Uh, if they are, or if you can find it on the secondary. This is one of my favorite light weather or just light, uh, light pants knives. This is a, 
uh, for a titanium frame lock. It is super thin, super light, just luxe action. I love the action on this knife. It it behaves kind of half like a really dialed in um, bearings knife and then half, especially on the clothes, like a really well-tuned um, phosphor bronze washer knife. Uh, so this is the Yakut from, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. I just said Yakut like I know. Uh, but Y-A-K-U-T, Yakut from Siberian, Siberia and Russia, uh, the Crystal Aurora. Check it out. Isn't that a handsome knife? Jimped all over the place, but subtly so. These are all like rows of jimping. Beautiful knife. All right, next up, uh, one that I mentioned briefly before, but the Kiridashi from uh, Japan. Now, this folder is... Uh, Part of uh, partly inspired by the uh, by the Kiridashi. I mean, largely inspired by the Kiridashi. This is the Michael Janich designed um, uh, Yojimbo Two. Uh, Michael Janich was on the show a couple of times here. Awesome dude. Very uh, interesting and knows what he's doing in terms of self defense. He's a uh, <laughs> he's got a very interesting history. You gotta you gotta check out these shows. Uh, he was on episode fifty eight and. Uh, 248 of the Knife Junkie podcast. Actually, uh, to listen to that, just go to the knifejunkie.com slash 58 or slash 24 and listen to him talking about the design of this knife. Uh, but the Kiridashi is a straight bladed, uh, kind of sax like, kind of chisel like uh, utility blade, uh, traditional utility blade from Japan. Now he took that pointy front, that triangular front and straight edge and uh, oriented it uh, downward a little bit more like a sax to create this amazing self-defense knife. Yojimbo, I think, means... I used to know what it means, like bodyguard? Or is that Kobun? Uh, but anyway, this is uh, definitely designed and bred by Michael Janich as a self-defense knife. And I have added that little 5x5 five five Solutions pocket opener on top. But it really, really excels as a utility knife. Now, the one thing you have to be careful about is that this, in this case, uh, this is CPM 20 CV. Um, and you know it's done right because it's Spyderco and they just, their heat treats are the best apparently. Uh, but uh, also it is very thinly hollow ground, though only half of it. So you do have to be careful with the tip. This one has been reprofiled and re-tipped uh, by Jared Neve because I dropped this in the sink at work shortly after I bought it dinged off the tip. I was so pissed. Uh, but this is such a great utility knife, great self-defense knife, small and a, and a and a really good fidgeter too, just because it's got that uh, compression lock. So awesome knife. I have added the uh, deep carry MSG gear clip. And this one was a DLT exclusive uh, with carbon fiber and 20 CV. Next up and very related, similarly, uh, no, no, no. Just like pyramids popped up all over the world at the same time. Same thing. This is the sax, a similar style blade. Uh, this one is, uh, so the sax is a Northern European blade used in uh, all the Nordic countries, Germany and um, uh, um, England and Scotland and all across Northern Europe. And this is Emerson Knives version of that. Again, you see a pretty much a straight edged blade with a, uh, with an edge, I mean, sorry, with a spine that drops at an angle uh, towards the tip, creating sort of a triangle. Now, with traditional European sax knives, you can see they uh, sometimes that edge gets more and more curved to the point where it almost looks like a clip point, like a Bowie. They approach Bowie at, at a certain point uh, as you start to curve that cutting edge. Uh, so very interesting to look at all the different sort of sax style knives there are. Um, traditionally in in the various uh, northern european cultures but this uh emerson version pocket version is uh just such a dream and i gotta say one of my favorite for a long time it was my favorite emerson i'm not sure if i can if i can call it that in earnest but i love it the one thing that holds it this knife back in my opinion is the double finger partition but for a double finger partition knife it is extremely comfortable you know emerson and the ergonomics. The other thing about Emerson's that stick in the craw a little bit is that the wave 
precludes you from putting your your hand up on or your thumb up on the blade most of the time. Um, but there it is, the Emerson sax, a represent a modern folding representation of the Northern European sax knife. Next, also European, the cruciform dagger. Uh, in this case, um, uh, created by Arcane Designs and uh, um, 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 Israel Bacchus. I used to check out, we did two podcasts with him, 196 and 236. So just go to knifejunkie.com slash 196 or 236 to hear me talking with um, Israel Bacchus. He's such a cool dude. And, and man, he designs cool knives. This one was a collaboration design with um, Felix of Something Obscene Company. And um, <laughs> it is it is stunning. It's one of the few uh, perfectly symmetrical and perfectly double-edged ground dagger blades uh, in the folding realm out there. I can think of the arch nemesis, very, 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 very out of reach and exclusive arch nemesis by Sharp by Design and the very hard to come by Maximus by Hinderer Knives. When are you going to do another run of those? Um, and then there's this. And I, I'm sure there are some other customs out there, but uh, I was drawn to this immediately uh, for its design. It's, it's beautiful sort of cruciform. Um, well, I'll put it this way for that looks european looks like it came off a spaceship too uh double-edged um just one of my you know just one of those things i'll never give up because it's so rare uh this one has the bronze titanium with the fluting it's actually very comfortable it doesn't look like it would be i think i might do a, a wardrobe change today and carry this the rest of the day uh it's got that beautiful um satin a machine satin that we know from Riot, and just wicked, wicked sharp. Uh, I was going back and forth between this and the black bladed version, but I decided I wanted to see those grind lines that I love so much from Riot. So uh, here you go. If you want a traditional sort of, well, a very sci-fi modernized traditional cruciform European dagger uh, with double edges, well, you got this option. Also, I think he does these. I think when he releases these, he will do a few in a single edge just for those uh, faint of heart, those rabbit hearted fools who don't want double edge. I'm just kidding. For those who actually follow their local laws, he, he offers that. All right. Second to last in this illustrious list of modern day folders that take their design cues from traditional knives is one that. I don't have a tradi I don't have one of these. I need to get one for this wall here. Uh, and that is the Turkish Yatagan. I love that knife. A Turkish Yatagan. And this is the cold steel vaque uh, vaquero. Now you're saying vaquero, vaquero, that is not a Turkish word. And you would be right. Um, the original, let's see. Yes, I do have it in pocket. The original um, vaquero designed by cold steel appeared on the El Hombre in the late 90s. Here's an El Hombre there, and also on the Vaquero Grande. Um, and at this time, uh, they were more inspired by Mexican by Mexican knives here, but Navajas via Me Mexico. Um, and then uh, as this design evolved or changed, evolved always kind of... Uh, implies improvement now i'm not sure if that i'm not going to make that judgment but when they changed from this design to this design for the vaquero um lynn thompson started looking more at the yatagan instead of the navaja the yatagan has the deep recurve uh like this now you should look it up it's a very cool knife uh it's as i mentioned and as it says there from turkey but it has the deep recurve that we've all come to know and love as an efficient cutter, but it also comes back up and places the tip in the center line so that uh, no matter the orientation, you know, if you're, you're attacking from, if I'm, if I'm attacking from this end, I still have the point in the center. If I'm attacking from this side, number eight, I still have in Kali, I still have the tip in the center. If it's a, it's a forward thrust or an overhead, I still have the tip. I know where the tip is all the time. You don't get that in some, in many recurve knives, like the next one we'll talk about. Uh, you have to make certain uh, wrist 
alterations to get the point to work, not with the Yatagan. So, so the difference between the El Hombre here and the, the, the next generation of Voyager is the point, where the point is. If you look at here, look at the pivot. The point is down below the pivot. If you look at the pivot here, the point is aligned with the pivot. Point aligned with the pivot on the new one, point below the pivot on the old one. If <laughs> You can't see what I'm talking about. All right, so that is the Cold Steel uh, Voyager, um, their Vaquero uh, blade design, and the Yatagan. So very cool knife. I love the Voyagers. All right, last up. Oh, I love this thing. This was a gift from my wife, um, uh, and partially because I told her I wanted it, but she spent the amount of money on it for a knife. She doesn't like to spend a lot of money on knives. Uh, <laughs> she spent that money because she likes the designer. This is uh, the Jason Knight designed um, MK Ultra. Uh, this one was produced by Fox and distributed by Elements. Uh, now it is just distributed by Fox, but just an awesome kukri. He, uh, Jason Knight, is makes the best modern kukris, if you ask me. Uh, best designed modern kukris, especially when it comes to this folder. He really, really nailed it. Now, I have the Raja 2. I love the Raja 2 by Cold Steel. They're big, uh, oversized kukri design. But to me, this captures the traditional essence of the kukri even more so. Uh, the handle is very comfortable and also evocative of the kukri shape. As is the Raja, not taking anything away from the Raja, but the overall curve, the Raja is a more straight knife. This overall curve is really what does it. Excuse me. And then when you have it in hand here, I'm going to go to this big, uh, the main camera here. When you have it in hand, it really gives you this uh, downward, um, uh, downward reaching recurve. But the way Jason Knight designed it, he is keeping the, the tip higher up so it, it is a little bit easier to thrust though you do might have to change your your if you're coming on an outside angle like this outside thrust like this you're going to have to turn your wrist in a little more uh you know that is all theoretical that is all theoretical because if you're fighting with this knife um god help you you know who knows what's going to happen or what you're going to do you might have years of training with this knife in particular and still forget to turn the blade in because you're like wow i'm actually in a knife fight and this is the hor most wor horrible worst nightmare of all time uh so who knows when i speak like this it's all theoretical because i'm not a warrior and i'm not a knife fighter but i have had a lot of theoretical training in in the in the martial arts studios so that's kind of where i come from when i talk about this uh, on this knife in particular, I love the harpoon. I'm not generally a harpoon guy, but it gives your thumb that perfect place to rest. Love that giant fuller because uh, you can open it. That's actually my preferred way of opening it is using the fuller. And it's just got luscious, luscious action on that titanium frame lock. So uh, this has been my 12 ethnographic folder design uh, survey. I have more, I think. I mean, I started looking through and, and and a lot of knives that I have, you can see where there's a jumping off point. Maybe it's not as direct as this, uh, Nepalese Kukri to this MK Ultra, but you start looking at your folder collection and you'll start noticing um, the traditional uh, uh, jump off points. It's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I like the translation. All right. Well, thank you for joining me on this uh, Knife Junkie podcast. It's been uh, great talking at you about this stuff. And you actually, you spared my wife and daughters uh, from this lecture. So consider yourself humanitarians. Join us tomorrow night, Thursday night, uh, for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch. And if you'd like to become a patron, do so by scanning the QR code on your screen or going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.